Uh, good morning, fellow equestrian, uh, equestrian adventurists. Uh, my name's Heather. I'm here today with my co-host Uta. Um, we're super excited for the interview that we have for you today. Uta, who do we have? Well, thank you, Heather. Good morning to you, too. I'm very happy to be here with you. And today we do have a very, very special guest. Today we welcome on the show Crystal Kelly, FAI equestrian coach, consultant, and founder of the equestrian community. So we're going to talk a little bit about her journey with horses, how it started, where it took her, and what her plans for the future are. So welcome, Crystal. So glad you're here with us today. Thank you, guys. I'm excited. Great. So I'll just start off with the first question. So we get into the interview soon and you can talk all and you can tell us all about um, your journey with horses. So Perfect. we want to know first, how did your journey with horses begin? When did you start riding and when did you realize that you want to become a professional in the equestrian field? So I did not have horses growing up. Um, I'm from California and it's like only for rich people. So for me, I started taking lessons when I was nine. I had to beg my parents and I could only afford to take two lessons a month. So yeah, I, I shoveled stables and I worked for it and I took my two lessons every month. I wore my little like cowgirl outfit and I was like, I'm going to be a cowgirl and I'm going to ride horses someday. And yeah, that's kind of how I started. Um, but yeah, basically I, I've always loved horses. And I always wanted to work with horses, though when I was young, no one told me that you could work with horses. So I didn't know it was an option. But I was just very determined. I was like, I'm going to work with horses. And so I pursued my passion. I went to an international equestrian college. That's what they call themselves. Um, and then I started working overseas. I started working with horses when I was 15, actually. Um, and then I started working overseas. Um, the day I turned 21 years old, I was actually on a flight to go work my first international equestrian job. And I think once I went international, I never looked back and I just kind of kept bouncing around to a lot of different places. Um, I've always pursued more high level riding, let's say. So that's why I have my FEI level two coaching, because for me, it wasn't just enough to kind of, uh, I don't know, I wanted to be a top writer. I wanted to know the secrets, you know, I wanted to learn from the best. So I worked a lot with high level coaches and trainers and high level uh, horses. And yeah, so I kind of was pursuing show jumping mostly in these countries. And yeah, that's sort of how I started my journey, like the quick version. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, now with your working abroad, um, what sort of, you know, where did you start with that? Um, I know you've had some really exciting jobs. So, you know, tell us a little bit about where you went, you know, first. Um, and, and did you, did you choose the destination or did it choose you? So when I was at that equestrian college, I actually went there because, um, you know, they sold themselves as international college. So I went there because I was going to get access to their job book at the end of it when I was graduating. And so I kind of put all my hopes and dreams on this job book because I wanted to work overseas and I had no clue how to do that. Um, so I went to this college and I graduated, I got the job book and there was zero international jobs. <laughs> so I was like panicking because I'd been bragging for like nine months. I'm a bragger. And I've been bragging for nine months, like I'm gonna work overseas and no big deal. And suddenly I'm panicking because I don't, I don't know anyone overseas. I've never met a foreign person, like ever. And so, you know, I just go online and I found a job. And so a week after I graduated, I was actually on the plane and that was to Belgium was my first job. And at that time, I, if you would have asked me like point Belgium out on a map, honest to God, I wouldn't have been able to. I had no idea where that country was. I knew nothing about it, um, but it was with a, an Olympic eventing stables and I was like, it's overseas, so check. <laughs> so that's kind of how I, I went the first time. And you know, I'm from California and it's very sunshiny and Belgium, I went there and it was like just rainy clouds every day. <laughs> but they have chocolate there. Sorry? But they, but they do have chocolate there. That's true. Yes, they have chocolate and it's amazing chocolate. Every time I visit Belgium now, I have to have a hot chocolate, definitely. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of like a big culture shock, but it was great because I, um, 
I was grooming there and there was seven other, there were seven grooms in total at the time and they were from different countries. So, you know, we had a girl from Romania and we had a girl from Germany and a girl from France. And I would kind of visit their places or just kind of stay up all night chit chatting with them and asking them questions. And so that's how I really got addicted to wanting to see more and explore more. Great, thank you. Oh, very interesting. So, well, the next question is something um, I guess a lot of the equestrian adventurists would like to know. So, first of all, um, yeah, <clears throat> you once said that your husband was actually a non-rider when you met him. So, how did you meet your husband? And the main thing is, how did you get him on horseback? <laughs> yeah, um, it's funny. So, I, I this was in 2016. So, I love horses, but I also love just adventures in general. And an opportunity came for me where I decided to sign up for a car rally. So different kind of horsepower. And basically you drive from England to Mongolia and the route you kind of choose on your own. It's in a crappy car. That's the only rules that the car has to be crap. So I bought my car randomly off of eBay. It was like $500 um, guaranteed to basically explode in the middle of the desert, which is what it ended up doing. Um, and I, I had no teammates, um, so I went solo, had a hot pink car. We spray painted it pink, and the guy that I bought it from turned out to be a mechanic, and he was very enthusiastic. So I jumped in the car, the little pink yak, I called it, and yeah, just kind of headed east. And so I met my husband actually in Azerbaijan. I was waiting to catch a ferry boat, and I was actually trapped in Azerbaijan for five days, sleeping in my car. Um, because I had been officially stamped out of Azerbaijan, <laughs> like my car. And so I couldn't really go anywhere. And so I was just kind of waiting. And every day, I mean, there was a big like scam thing happening, but every day the, the person selling the ferry boat tickets would come and like, there's a ferry boat tonight. You know, there's going to be a ferry. And then, you know, it would be like 12 o'clock at night and they're like, oh no, no, tomorrow, tomorrow. So, you know, for five days and it's Azerbaijan. So it's like 45 degrees Celsius. It's hot. It's miserable. I hated it. There's no toilets because they don't expect women to be there. And so, you know, it was really awful. And my husband, he pulls up and he's Mr. Sunshine. So he pulls up on day five of me sleeping in my car and hating life. And he's all sunshiny and he walks directly to me, whatever it is. And he asks me when the next ferry boat is. And so that's how we met. <laughs> and I hated him because he was all sunshiny but I was secretly interested, of course. And so we ended up convoying because in Turkmenistan, we just kept bumping into each other. We bumped into each other like four times. And I think on the fourth time he was like, oh, let's just convoy together. And so, yeah, we started sort of driving together. And so we met in this car rally and, you know, when this rally happened, you know, he was a mechanical engineer. He has like an office job in Germany. And, you know, he was very obviously like flirting with me, but I was very like, no, I'm a, like, I'm a traveler. Like I work with horses. Like you can't handle my lifestyle. <laughs> you know, you, you live in an off, like you work in an office. It's just, it's not going to happen, dude. And, but he was very persistent. And so I think, I don't know, 20 countries later of him chasing me, he finally did capture me. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. he got me, I had a flight transfer thing in Belgium. And um, he just kind of randomly showed up and said, come with me to Germany. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of how we started dating officially. And so he always had been interested in horses. At least that's what he told me when we met, but I didn't know how true it was. But he <laughs> was always interested in horses. And so when we started dating, so when my car actually exploded it, um, in the desert somewhere, um, he actually at the time had given me some money to try and fix it. And the condition was that I have to someday give him riding lessons. <laughs> and I was like, oh, sure, no problem. So now we're Perfect dating. Exchange. Exactly. So now we're dating. So now I actually have to give him riding lessons. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we ended up um, in England, bought a horse, like the first month that I lived there. And he started very seriously taking riding lessons. Uh, five days a week, he was taking riding lessons. And he also took like um, groundwork lessons. He wanted to learn everything horsey. So yeah, he, he got addicted very quickly and he started doing all of the polo and all of the things with me at the stables. And now he has his own horsey. Um, so yeah, it kind of has escalated from there. I think, 
you know, for other women that they're like, how can I convince my man to do that? I think they have to be already kind of interested. Otherwise it might not work. Um, you know, they're just going to ride bicycles while you're riding the horse or something. But the fun thing is, I think because men in general, they like horsepower. Um, so once they're on a horse and they actually experience how thrilling it is, then, I mean, I think like for him, it was kind of a no brainer. Like once he did it, he was addicted. So yeah, that worked for me. <laughs> well, you're definitely a very lucky girl. <laughs> yes, definitely. Great. Um, so in all of your um, adventures, what has kind of been the most challenging experience that you've encountered and, and you know, how did you handle it? I would say in most of the countries, because, you know, they're male dominated, the ones that I was working. And the thing is, I'm blonde, I have green eyes, I'm like super white, and there's nothing I can do to hide that. You know, I've worn hijab, I've tried this, it, there's nothing I can do, you know, they know I'm a foreigner. Um, so usually when I'm working in these kind of countries, I have to balance, you know, because I'm in charge, and I'm in charge of a bunch of men. So I have to be the boss of them, but also I have to kind of work around their cultural you know things so i have to kind of tell them to do stuff but in a feminine nice way so that they'll actually do it <laughs> um so that in the beginning took it was very hard for me in the beginning because i just genuinely didn't know how to correctly handle that um especially my first experience was this with this was when i was working in egypt in cairo and it was actually the revolution at that time so all of the foreigners had been evacuated from the country so I was like the only white person and the grooms didn't speak any English. And, you know, they used to try and test me. And it took me a while before I could figure out what was the appropriate way for me to kind of deal with the situation without offending them. Um, so, you know, I got several marriage proposals or just weird stuff like that, you know, which every blonde girl walking down Cairo is going to get a hundred of those, but it's different when you're at the stables and you're like trying to saddle your horse and the groom comes in the stall, like, Oh yeah. Um, you should marry me. And by the way, my other two wives, they get like a hundred dollars a month. So I was thinking that you would also get like a hundred dollars. What do you think about that? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and they didn't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and the guy was like, you know, middle age, balding, doesn't speak English. Like there was no reason to say yes. Even if he was handsome, there's no reason. But still it was like, but he genuinely was looking at me like his proposal was just mind-blowing and was like you're gonna have all these things and clothes and this and that and I was like no thank you <laughs> <laughs> so he was kind of angry after that yeah um and I didn't really know in Arabic enough Arabic at the time I knew how to say no but I didn't know how to say like reasons why I didn't want to be his third wife you know <laughs> So yeah, it was definitely a, a strange situation in the beginning. Um, but now I feel pretty confident. I can pretty much go anywhere. I know how to, not necessarily if I know the language, but I know the, the body language. Like I know what to do. You know, that's why when I drove that car to Mongolia, I was solo, but I know what to do. I know how to handle myself in, in those kind of countries. So I wasn't too concerned about it. I wouldn't suggest that for every woman, but you know, at the level I was at that time, I was, I was fine with it. I was like, bring it. <laughs> it's very interesting, you know, how culturally from North America, um, you know, you're probably not going to get uh, a wedding proposals in the barn <laughs> in California, unless it's from your Prince Charming. But, you know, in, in other parts of the world, you know, that that was common practice, like you said, numerous times that, that it that it happened. So, so and it's funny, because in Arabic, the the language is actually extremely romantic. Like once you understand what they're saying, it's a super romantic language. So almost everything that they're saying is basically every Hollywood movie we've ever seen. Oh. So, you know, you're kind of hearing them and you're like, I'm trying not to be impressed by the fact that you're calling me the light of your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just kind of how they talk as well. So yeah, you have to get used to it, definitely. <laughs> Right. Okay. Right. Well, if, if you have to convince uh, four women to marry you, you have to be a little bit romantic, I guess. Otherwise, yeah, uh, you'll never exactly. get four wives. Exactly. Yes. You have to bring something. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, um, so what are your future plans from here? Which other adventures are still on your bucket list? Oh, gosh. So I am 
on a quest to see every country in the world. Um, not every country has horses, unfortunately, though I might change that. <laughs> um, so I intend on visiting everywhere. Um, I honestly haven't been to like a whole lot considering how much is on my bucket list. Um, but I do, I really love Africa. I would love to explore just all of it um, a lot more. And then also I, I'm fascinated with the Middle East. Um, so I find myself visiting the Middle East quite a lot. Um, so I definitely have a few countries in the Middle East on my list that I would like to visit. Hmm. Great. Awesome. Um, so now kind of uh, coming back to equestrian adventurists, you know, when and how did you come up with this idea to, to start this uh, great little, this journey? <laughs> so I have been traveling uh, basically my entire adult life, you know, working with horses. And I almost, you know, I ran into some foreigner ladies kind of doing similar to what I'm doing, let's say. Um, but I was really missing, I think, a community. Um, you know, I felt like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders, let's say. I was doing a lot, I was going into a lot of unknown places and trying to tackle a lot of things on my own. And I think at some point for me, it just felt nice, like what, uh, there's definitely other ladies out there. So what if there was kind of a safe space for all of us to kind of get together and actually like, I don't know, push each other up because I was getting pulled down so much, especially by men. <laughs> so, you know, I was so tired of getting pulled down all the time. I was like, we need a community where, you know, we can push each other up and we can help each other and give each other inspiration and advice because, you know, there's a lot of countries that I've personally visited that people that I know, you know, back in America from, you know, the village that I'm from, you know, so if I say I've been to those places, the first reactions they have is, oh my God, you know, it's so dangerous there. Like, well, no, actually they have some of the friendliest and nicest people I've ever met in my life. So, you know, I don't think you can actually make that kind of statement if you haven't been there or you don't know someone personally who's been there. So you get a lot of that, I think. So, you know, I really wanted that kind of community where, you know, you can see other people doing it and, and that somehow encourages you and motivates you to go out and, and do those things as well. Well, very, uh, we're very excited that you, that you started this because I've learned a lot just from spending time on the social media sites and, you know, going through the, through the website. And it's definitely something that um, I'm passionate about the, you know, Horses, traveling, adventure, you know, those are my, if someone was to describe me, that's probably the three words that they would use. So, so thanks for starting. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm happy when I hear. Um, I, I love hearing other ladies' stories, like more than I like sharing my own story, to be honest. So mm -hmm. I really love it when I get these kind of emails or, I don't know, Facebook or Instagram messages, and they're like, oh man, you've got to hear about the thing I did last week or, you know, something. <laughs> and I get a lot of these and it, it's, it's great. Um, I, I, I really enjoy it. Great. Yeah, it's great. No, it's, it's a very uh, valuable community, I think, for all the horsey ladies out there who love to travel, who love to do adventures and who just maybe need or want to have that little nudge, that little bit like, um, yeah, you can do it, that kind of encouragement. And I think that's very important. Um, uh, what we do or what you do is to encourage everyone. Yeah, follow your dreams. Go do that trip. Buy that horse. Uh, just do what you like. You know, follow your dreams. I think that is very, very important. And it's great to have this community for, for women who are like-minded. Great. Turning back a little bit to your, to your travels. So looking back at all the amazing places you have been, which trip or stay is especially memorable to you? I have quite a few. Um, speaking equestrian adventures, I would say last year I went to Greenland, which was kind of an outer body experience. Um, and it, it was, I mean, especially maybe because I'm from California and I was looking at these like icebergs floating in their yard basically <laughs> like that's their backyard and there's just an iceberg and the glacier is just around the corner so there's like a new iceberg every day and for them that's like so normal but for me it was like I can't believe that people live like this like this is an actual life and it was just so peaceful and so calming and it was a funny country like 
I still don't know how it works, to be honest, like how you can survive there. <laughs> but people are surviving there. And yeah, so I really enjoyed Greenland quite a lot. Um, it was very unique to experience it on horseback. Um, another country that I really like is Bhutan. Um, just because it's a Buddhist country, they're so friendly. And the thing about Bhutan, if you Google Bhutan, you know, you can see pictures of temples. But the thing is, because of their religion, you actually, you'll never find a photo of the inside of the Tiger's Nest Temple. You'll never see that photo. You know, you'll never see a photo of the inside of the Taj Mahal. So if you want to know what's inside, you have to go. And so, you know, when you go to Bhutan and you're hearing the legends and the stories and the things which, you know, they believe, and you're sitting inside this building, which even in 2020 with Google and internet and everything, the only way to see it and to hear these stories is to physically go there. And I think that's what my draw was to Bhutan. So I really like these kind of places, the kind of special places that you can't Google. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really yeah. like that, like that analogy. If you want to know what's inside, you have to go. Because you, you make a great point. Like we see all these beautiful things, um, but you don't see the inside. And there is that feeling of awe when you go in into some places that, you know, like specifically art, for example, you know, but that was painted a thousand years ago or 1500 years ago. Um, you know, in North America, we don't have anything that's even, you know, barely 500 years old. <laughs> so yeah. it really is something, uh, something else to, you know, just the appreciation, just that feeling. And, and I, and I think that that's the, the biggest part of all of these, you know, type of adventures is that feeling that you get um, when you experience something for the first time. So definitely, I would say I, my life is built around moments like that. Like that is why I do what I do. I mean, you know, there's some nightmare things that happen, flights get canceled or this happens or that happens. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, when you're going out on a equestrian trip, you know, an adventure of any kind, even if it's in your own home country, if it's just you riding around on the trails, but it's still like, it's an experience. And, um, you know, experiences are something that I think when I'm old, you know, and I have these memories, that's what I value the most. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so now you, you're a, a woman in the equestrian field, you know, you've made a career out of it. Um, what advice would you give to other women who are looking to, to start a career uh, in the equestrian field? I would say, firstly, education is the most important thing. And the problem is there's so many bad trainers or bad coaches out there with zero training, but they like read a horse book once or they saw Black Beauty and they think that they can train horsey things. And unfortunately, you see it quite a lot. Um, so I think education is extremely important because when you're educated and you know how to work with horses or how to ride to a like pretty good level, you know, not just like comfortably, like you're not going to die or something, but like you actually know how to help the horse and how to improve, you know, what's happening or whatever it is. Um, I think the more that you educate yourself when you go to other countries or whatever, and they do lack the education, you are now educated and qualified that you can actually help them and you can be an ambassador. And so, you know, I think that's how I started working in a lot of the places that I did, because when I went somewhere, word of mouth travels very quickly in a lot of places where Google doesn't work. So as soon as you're good at something, suddenly you're extremely valuable and everyone wants to know you. So when I was in India, I ended up staying for two years just because I would leave one stables and I'm like, I'm done with this place and I'm never going to stay here again. And then I'd get a phone call and they're like, Hey, I have 70 horses. What do you think about coming for six months? I'm like, Oh, okay. That sounds good. So, you know, I just kind of kept staying and finding different places. And I, you know, I found a lot of fun in doing that and I enjoyed it. Um, but you know, when you can actually bring something valuable, I think it's, it makes a difference. You know, when you visit the Taj Mahal and you see those horses that are I don't know they're kind of those carriage horses and they're really sad looking but I can actually go to someone and in Hindi I was comfortable enough at the time I'm not anymore but I could kind of explain to him like hey your bridle doesn't fit do you mind if I adjust it for you and I could kind of educate him in a non-offensive way and they're happy for that feedback and that information um, but a lot of times people when they're kind of visiting they'll sort of I don't know ignore it or they'll say something like 
they'll post a picture on Facebook like, oh, don't go to horse riding in India. Oh, they're all bad, but that's just not true. You know, I can actually go there and make a difference. And maybe because I taught him how to adjust his bridle correctly, who knows, maybe he'll show someone else. Right, maybe his son will now do it correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like that. So I think educate yourself um, to a good level and don't be afraid to, you know, buy the ticket and just, just kind of go for it. Right. Buy the ticket. Right. It's always a good idea just to buy the ticket. Yeah, exactly. You never regret it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go, go the first step. I think the first step is the hardest. And once you've taken the first step, then, you know, like the feet go themselves. It will just, you know, just start it and things will kind of run it for you. That is Definitely. a very good advice, actually. Yeah, definitely. Cool. And, and, you know, a lot of people, they see me now and they're like, oh, well, you've traveled everywhere. So it's easy for you. I'm like, well, I used to be a super hardcore Californian girl. Like, I didn't even know that clothes could be dried in the sunshine. I didn't know that was a thing. Okay. I, I, I had washing and drying machines my entire life. And the first time I was in Egypt and I had to go and wash my clothes, I actually had to ask my roommate, how do you dry your clothes? There's no drying machine. <laughs> and I mean, she was from the Netherlands. She was busting up laughing like, Crystal, you're in Egypt. You hang them in the sunshine. And I like, I was totally mind blown because I didn't, I genuinely never would have thought of that. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, there's no drying machine. What do I do? <laughs> so I used to be that girl, you know? So, you know, wherever you're starting at now, it doesn't really matter because 10 years from now, you're going to look and you're going to laugh and that's going to be your favorite go-to story that you tell people. <laughs> Great, great. So one last question to wrap it up. Um, yeah, you put together travel guides for horseback vacations. You've published um, books with horse stories. You established this podcast. Plus you established a YouTube channel. So lots and lots of things you've done in the last, um, well, since you've started the Equestrian Adventurers, since you started the community. So what else do you plan to do? I'm a very busy person. <laughs> I like to do things. Indeed, I don't like indeed. to just, I don't like to just sit around. Um, so definitely where I want to obviously grow the podcast, I mean, with you guys, and I'm very excited for how that's going to go. And as far as like the videos and stuff, I'm actually working on, so I filmed sort of mini documentaries last year, and I'm going to make two of them into actual like full feature documentaries. So those are going to be on Amazon Prime, as well as uh, Horse Network, uh, which is kind of like the horsey Netflix. And then also they're going to be entered in the, you know, different film festivals and things. So I'm working on some of these uh, documentaries. And I'm also, I, I love video in general. So I, I'm I think I would like to pursue some more films at some point after, after the whole lockdown thing <laughs> finishes. And then as far as adventuresses goes, um, there's really no limits. I think, I don't know. It's like, how many people is it okay to help? Is 10 enough? Is a hundred enough? Is a million, is a billion people enough to help? Like, I don't think there's an end, you know, when you're helping people, there's always someone that you can help. So I think just kind of continuing to, grow have more articles have more ladies involved in the different programs if they like to write stories or write books or this or that just whatever platform where you know they can get that information and they can sort of learn and be inspired and be encouraged and support one another um i definitely want to continue building those things so yeah i think for adventuresses i'm just gonna let it go as far as it likes to go and help as many people as as possible great well, lots of scope on that, I suppose. Yes. Um, so we have come up with some rapid fire questions for you. Um, so you're not, they're not, uh, you're, you're not going to have to dig out your uh, high school notes to answer <laughs> these questions. So, you know, as, as um, you know, whatever comes to the top of your mind. Uh, so the Perfect. first one is, what is your must pack travel item? Um, so definitely chapstick. I have to have that. I think I will physically die if I don't have chapstick. <laughs> um, I also, I, I do always, it's funny cause we covered this in the last podcast. I always have a scarf, um, in every country that I go to or some kind of like buff thing that I can cover my face or something. Um, and then of course I always have my like helmet and breeches and my boots and then my I have a helmet bag which I use as a purse <laughs> so I always have my little blue spotty helmet bag yeah 
which I get some laughs for, but it's fine. <laughs> Great. Perfect. So um, concerning your travel habits, are you a long-term planner or a winged style traveler? I don't think I've ever planned anything. I love spontaneous stuff. Like if you message me and you say, hey, Crystal, you feel like coming to India tomorrow? I'm like, sure, I'll check the flights. <laughs> so I really love... I love spontaneous stuff. Um, even if I have something booked like two months away, I don't even Google anything. Maybe like the first night hotel or maybe something like that. Um, but yeah, I think for me, I like to see what happens. I'm a very <laughs> loosey goosey person. So I almost, yeah, I, I almost never plan anything. And if planning has to be done, I probably like, unload it to someone else like my husband or my my mom loves planning things like she's obsessed with planning things so if like something has to be planned like a dentist appointment i'm like mom <laughs> i need a dentist appointment <laughs> so yeah I, i'm bad about that stuff <laughs> funny um favorite horse breed oh gosh this is hard because there's so many lovely ones my childhood horse breed was definitely the libazaner and I was absolutely obsessed with them. So I luckily got to ride one for the first time ever last year. And that was like a little dream come true moment. <laughs> um, so yeah, I love the Lipizzaners. But I'm a show jumper. So I love warm bloods. Like I love big, huge horses with some like oomph behind them. I love riding them. Uta, are you still with? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. She seems to have. Oh, been... she cut out, I think. Oh, yeah. she did. Okay, well, hopefully she... She might try and sign back in or something, yeah. Uh, so I'll continue on. So your favorite riding style? Um, you mean like riding discipline or... Yes. So, like I said, I am a show jumper. I love show jumping, but also I love polo. Polo is a lot of fun just because no one cares how you look like when you're playing polo. It's like, can you hit the ball? Which is a lot of fun. Um, so I enjoy... Uh, show jumping definitely and I also love uh, polo is quite fun <laughs> oh, great um if you could spend one year paid off where would you go hmm how many countries can I do in a year <laughs> <laughs> I would probably choose like five favorites and spend like I don't know a couple months in each of these Bali is definitely going to be on that list because oh. I love Bali and every like I don't know. It's kind of my happy place when I'm in Bali. I'm just like, oh, this is how the world is supposed to be. So I would definitely go to Bali. Great. Um, favorite color? My favorite color is pink. The Equestrian hey. Adventure is pink, of course. <laughs> Great. Um, so besides uh, riding and traveling, do you have any other hobbies? So like I said, I like cars. I like... Um, I don't know. I like fast things maybe. So I enjoy car rallies and I would like to at some point do some car rallies. And I also am obsessed with helicopters and I'm scared of heights. So I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm convinced that I would make a great helicopter pilot. <laughs> so that is on the agenda at some point. <laughs> well, great. I, I think uh, Uta's trying to come back into the, into, I. Oh, perfect. Um, so there I, you are. <laughs> Yay! Oh, she's coming back. Oh, yeah. Okay, so what's your biggest addiction? Which kind of falls into your hobby, but... Yeah, uh, definitely travel and horses are my two things I could never live without. Perfect. Um, Uta, just to, to catch you back up, we're just, we're, we're about three quarters of the way through the rapid fire, and we're just on the, uh, what's one thing you've always wanted to do question? Yeah, I just as uh, you just lost me there, guys, because uh, my internet connection is a bit sketchy today because we had very heavy rains here. So uh, still clouds, still rain is going on. So this is monsoon time in India. So I'm so sorry that I <laughs> have to leave you for a minute, but I'm back here. So we just uh, get into the next one. So um, what's the one thing you've always wanted to do? Hmm. I'm the problem with me is I don't just have one thing like I have a hundred million things all the time that I want to do I have a bucket list and every it's got like a hundred things on there and if I cross one thing off I immediately put another one on there so this bucket list has never shrunk in the past 10 years I've been traveling um, I I want to go to Saudi Arabia 
I think there's a lot of questions that need answering and I'm only going to get those answers if I visit. Um, so I, that's one thing that it's definitely on my radar. Great. Um, well, you know, when you said you talk about bucket list, um, I wrote a mechanical ball last fall. So I got to mark that off of my, uh, of my bucket list. Um, and it was way harder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> See, I would feel nervous because I would walk in like, I'm the equestrian. This is going to be like no problem. And then, yeah, yeah I'm sure I would exactly eat my words. That's exactly how it went. <laughs> I was like, I ride horses. I can do this. And I think I stayed on for two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Injected out the back. Um, are you an early bird or a night owl? Um, I'm kind of a night owl. Um, yeah, but with horses, like you have to wake early. So I am, I think I'm adjusted. I accept the fact that life starts early, but I prefer the night. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's all, all, all the same. I guess you have to feed them early. That's the problem. Except, so the horses, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's right. So what is the strangest thing you have ever eaten? Um, I will say, I'm going to admit this. I'm not a foodie. <laughs> and so my idea of like food hunting abroad is trying to find a pizza place. So the weirdest thing I've ate is probably like I ate camel meat. And in Laos, I was invited, I went to this small village and it's not a touristy village. I was actually warned not to go to this village because they would, the children would see me and cry or throw stones at me. Like that's genuinely what their reaction was going to be. And I was like, no, I have to go. And so I went and it was like a really long hike. And I had this fixer with me and I went there. And of course, because I arrived, like the chief of the village invited me in. And I don't know what the meat was that he fed me, but I do know when I was in Laos, I saw them eating rat. I saw them eating dog, like, and I didn't see any cows around. So it was one of those, like, I didn't ask because I didn't really want to know what it was. Um, but that was a little bit questionable. <laughs> but, you know, there wasn't any pizza, unfortunately. So I had to just get on with it. <laughs> um, our, now, we had discussed before, um, Uta is a huge reader. That's her, her number one travel item is to always take a book. Um, I tend to fall into the reading category of you know, the romances, because I know they always have a happy ending. Um, but are you, uh, is there a book you're currently reading? Um, I, I'm kind of with you, Heather. I am, I, like, it has to be a happy ending for me as well. I get offended if I watch, like, a romance, like, romantic comedy movie, and they don't end up together. I'm like, that's the whole reason why I'm watching this stupid thing. <laughs> so that's, that's my experience as well. Um, and maybe you see that reflected a little bit in the Adventuresses books, because I am a sucker for happy endings. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I am reading a lot of, I read a lot of, like, motivational books, um, so not necessarily horsey at the moment, but more inspirational. Um, so I am reading a book called The One Thing. Um, like I said, I like to be busy. So this book is about kind of focusing your energy on one thing. <laughs> so that is what I'm currently reading right now. Great. Great. So what was the last horse movie you have watched? I, it's... It's funny with the horse movies as well. I always, I love happy endings and there's so many horsey movies where they're like sad and they make you cry. And I cannot watch like the Black Beauty or something like that because I, I just, I cannot cope with it. Um, so I love the movie Hidalgo because um, it's super right. adventurous and I feel like yeah, the horse is just really fun. cool. So I love that movie and that's kind of my go-to when I want like some kind of adventure. Great. That's a favorite of mine too. And the, and the main actor in there isn't too hard on the eyes either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> uh, right. Well, this has been great. Well, first of all, I want to thank both of you because it was really, really interesting uh, time we had together, a little interesting chit-chat. I hope our audience also enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed recording it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy and I have no idea where this journey is going to take us, but it was great having you guys and uh, it was lots of fun. So thanks thank a you. lot for the great time. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, I enjoyed your questions very much. I know I, I don't usually talk about myself on the Adventuresses podcast, so this was, this was fun. Perfect. Well, so it was, it was a unique opportunity then. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, now my secrets are out. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
Uh, thank, thanks, Crystal. Um, so we will sign off. So don't forget to uh, check us out on our website, equestrianadventuruses.com, as well as on the Facebook page. Um, you know, we're always looking for feedback on uh, uh, topics for the podcast. Uh, so get in touch with us because our goal is to provide you with all the information you need to feel confident to go out on your own equestrian adventure.